So welcome everybody to uh, this Google Hangout session of our course Rethinking International Tax Law. Great that you can uh, all join. Uh, I think it has been a fantastic experience for, for all of us to discuss the fascinating topic of international taxation uh, in the year 2015. So much is happening and I'm uh, really, um, uh, really glad that, uh, that we found uh, four students prepared to, to join us in this Google Hangout session. For students who really stood out during the course, uh, their forum contributions, but also their papers were of uh, outstanding quality. So I'm uh, extremely happy to welcome today Scott Lang, Benjamin Poo, uh, Lucas Carvalho, and Lisanne Bergwerf to, uh, to discuss with us today uh, the topic of uh, ethical aspects of tax planning. So what we're going to do. We're going to reflect, also especially on module six of our course, um, ethical aspects of tax planning, the normative viewpoint. What should actually change in, uh, well, in the future? The behavior of companies, perhaps the behavior of states. Well, before we, um, we really get, get uh, starting with our conversation, uh, may I ask uh, everybody to introduce themselves briefly? And may I start with you, Scott? I well, thank you for the invitation to the uh, chat, and um, I enjoyed the course. Uh, briefly, I'm in uh, Toronto, Canada, and uh, my I guess my introduction to the topic of taxation was via my uh, master's degree uh, here in Toronto, um, which I had an opportunity to approach it from a very different perspective. I think that is uh, that occurs in the mainstream, and I was hoping to be able to talk about that. Uh, a little bit today. Um, so I don't work in the tax industry. Um, I pay taxes and uh, I do have an interest in the subject. So I guess that's my basic introduction. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot for your introduction. And uh, you're from North America, from uh, from Canada. So that's, that's great. Correct. Well, let's, let's move. Let's move a little bit east. Uh, perhaps you can put yourself on mute again. Uh, let's move a little bit east to um, to Malaysia. Benjamin. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Good. Uh, I don't know. Good evening or good afternoon. <laughs> uh, I'm a, actually a tax lawyer from Malaysia. I'm. I did my PhD in tax law from Washington uh, Institute of. Uh, Okay. U US and uh, I'm also a charter accountant having my practice uh, in Malaysia uh, dealing with most of the tax issues and also litigate uh, some of the cases uh, in our court. So I'm very grateful uh, Leiden has actually make a significant uh, uh, so-called uh, contribution. I mean, to all the the worldwide uh, international society, international community, and uh, I, there is a courses coming to our Malaysia, with Malaysia government, Leiden with Malaysia government is going to uh, conduct a executive, uh, I think, certificates in international taxation. This is a very good uh, a movement uh, for to equip Malaysia to understand more about international taxation. That's my introduction. Thank you very much, Ben. And um, great, great that you can join us uh, all from uh, all the way from Malaysia. And Thanks. if you put yourself on mute again, then we can go to uh, to South America, to uh, to Brazil. Uh, Lucas Cavalho, welcome. Hi. Um, hello. Um, my name is Lucas Carvalho. Um, it's a pleasure to be here in this hangout. I am uh, a tax lawyer here in Brazil, and um, I studied in the LLM in international taxation at New York University in the United States, and also executive MBA in China and MBA in Brazil. Uh, and it's a long story, but it's uh, um, it's it's a pleasure to be a part of this course. 
it was um, it was amazing going through the materials and being able to discuss issues of international taxation with people from all around the world with different perspectives from different backgrounds some of them favorable to tax authorities um, some of them not favorable um, some of them discussing the ethical aspects some of them discussing just the formal aspects of tax planning it was absolutely amazing the opportunity was great and uh, I just love to um, write on the subject of international taxation and discuss um, new and current issues like the PEPS project and uh, and so on so that's my introduction Thank you very much, uh, Lucas. Great that you can join us. And finally, from uh, Europe, from the Netherlands, is joining us Lisanne Bergwerf. Lisanne, hello. Good afternoon. Uh, yeah. uh, 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 thank you very, ver thank you very much for this invitation. I'm Lisanne Bergwerf, I, and I study tax law at Leiden University, and I'm currently in my masters. And um, and next to this, I'm I'm a working student in the field of international taxation at a big law firm in Amsterdam. And that's my introduction. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Elisanne. Great, great that you're here. Uh, a great experience that also students from Leiden University are joining us in this course. So I think if I look back on all the introductions, we actually have quite a diverse uh, variety of participants, namely from, from four different continents, and also with different uh, levels of experience. So uh, a text law student, a few people with uh, very much uh, experience in the area of international fixation, uh, but also uh, Scott uh, from Canada, who does not have, who is not working already in the field of international tax law. But you know, Scott, perhaps after this course, new opportunities might be uh, might be open for you because you are obviously now an international tax law expert. So well, let's hear yes. <laughs> Perhaps we can uh, we can start by asking you. Um, what what is in your in your personal what is your personal view and perhaps also the view of your fellow countrymen um, your opinion about well ethical aspects of, of, of tax planning by companies the role of states what what, what what views can you share with us? Well, um, it's not a big issue I think in terms of headlines in the news. Um, I think it flies under the radar as it does likely in most areas of the world. Um, it's, um, I think most people consider it to be very dry. As people have mentioned here, it's not very exciting as far as a news item. Um, the effect, the uh, official tax rate has been dropping fairly steadily in Canada um, over different governments, over the liberal government and the conservative government, uh, which has been in power federally for, um, for quite a few years now. Um, so that trend is continuing uh, from center right uh, through to the right. Uh, we had a province recently that uh, that was traditionally conservative that that uh, recently elected a provincial government um, which is more socialist, has a socialist history, and they've announced recently that they're going to be hiking corporate tax rates in that in that. Uh, province. So I think largely ethics really depends on the side of the ideological line that you're on. And I think that really um, speaks to what I recognize and what I really wanted to talk about today, um, it, which is the, uh, the scientific, the nature of the scientific value or inquiry that goes into this topic. And uh, I don't want to take anything off track or anything, so if you're open to hearing more about that, I mean, I can talk more about the ethics if you like. Um, but uh, I, was, I was kind of hoping to participate in a little bit of a discussion on that. Um, I mean, I, I don't really see ethics being too different anywhere in the world. Um, you know, people are always going to not want to pay taxes, and they're going to wonder why corporate corporations aren't being taxed more, and so forth. Um, so I, I think scientifically, what I noticed in the course, and this kind of speaks indirectly to your, to your question, but in the course, what I noticed was an absence of data. Um, I know there was the paper from the Chicago School 
that, that, that had a little bit of an inquiry and analyzed the data and did a brief survey on, on the, uh, on the uh, papers out there on data. But there seemed to be very little of it. I don't know if that was intentional to keep it more, you know, more people friendly in that sense. I have done research myself through various international databases and I know that there are very real considerations. Just getting a hold of the data sets is one thing, which they don't always exist. Or they do exist, but they might, particularly in Europe, you know, they're very brief. They might go back to the 90s or 80s at, at the very earliest. So it's very hard to get that historical perspective. But of course, you're dealing with different uh, accounting practices and accounting standards uh, from country to country, um, which makes the data even more problematic as far as being meaningful. Um, so. But that's what I noticed, and I think in order for scientific inquiry to happen, you have to have data sets that are useful in order to provide the analysis for those data sets. And a lot of the papers, particularly from the OECD, I found were, were uh, completely absent of that, or they didn't really refer to it much. Uh, it might, might have been based on it, but I didn't really get that impression. So you go from that to the other end of the spectrum, which is the theory, okay? The theory informs the hypothesis and the analysis that, that addresses the data. And in my, in my research and my study in, in the broader spectrum of, of capitalism, there is not really a very workable or feasible or useful theory of, on capital, on how capital works, which is a broad issue, but to narrow it to what we're talking about, an international tax law. Um, and I was afraid of this. <laughs> My mind's gone blank. Uh, <laughs> I'm not used to being on the work. Happens to me all the time. Yeah, no, this is great. And we can't we can't stop this. So let's hope my mind catches up to uh, what were we talking about? Uh, international tax law. So so basically with um, Blank again. Well, if I uh, come back to your point about the yeah. scientific data, yeah. uh, if you put yourself on mute for, for a while, uh, or perhaps for one minute, then uh, the, 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 the camera won't flip around. So um, you're very right, of course, to point this out, because I think there is a lack of, uh, of, of data. And in fact, it is one of the action points of the OECD's DEPS action plan to, uh, to come up with more data. Uh, I think one of the problems is in, in collecting data is you have to know what is it that you are measuring, where should taxes have to be paid, and that of course depends on uh, all the rules uh, which are there. And I mean, if that is not really really clear, what kind of rules should we have? What should what should have been the reality? Where should the taxes have been paid in comparison with where they actually have been paid? That is very difficult if you don't have the um, a clear picture of what the rules uh, try to achieve in the first place. Sure. If, if I could just, I think I might have re regained my my uh, train of thought. Uh, I think you're correct, obviously, and you're dealing with it from a uh, more, I guess, uh, policy uh, perspective. Um, you need to enact uh, policy and so forth, and how you engage with this in very practical means. Um, for example, I think. What I took from this course is that there's very much a uh, what you might call a Newtonian uh, relation expressed between corporations and governments. Okay, so they're always they're always clashing with each other. Corporations are always antagonistic towards governments and so forth. And you kind of get that sense. Of course, we also pointed out in the course that there is tax competition. So not only between tax havens, but between G7 countries that are trying to attract corporations. So they're not always clashing with each other, but definitely in terms of hiding taxes, um, they are. I guess I would suggest perhaps a more nuanced approach as to what corporations, um, in other words, from the perspective that I'm kind of looking at it from is more of a differential perspective in which uh, corporations are in competition with each other. And corporations, particularly dominant capital, uh, global capital, 
uh, capital that exists in the oligarchy of the particular markets or industries. Um, they can set the prices and and um, and work with governments so as to exclude competitors and exclude you know the broader base of corporations within their market uh, from competition in the in the, in the, uh, in the higher oligarchy that determines how the market is run. Uh, so that's a huge topic. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say briefly, I'm trying to summarize here as I go, but uh, I think in order for ethics and fairness to come into the picture, you really need to have a strong scientific base, a data-driven base that has strong analysis and that has useful theory. And I'm, I'm somewhat, uh, I, I don't think that that really exists. And, and until that can really take place, um, we're really going to be kind of, you know, uh, skirting around the, the main issues and, and not being as effective as we would like to be in terms of fairness. It's a huge issue, and we, we, I think we could all talk for hours and hours on our own little, uh, you know, experiences and so forth, so I'll have to leave it at that. Well, thanks a lot, Scott. I think these are some, some excellent points, and, and I uh, couldn't agree with you more that we need more, uh, more, more reliable data to really to give uh, the policy discussion also some more firm ground, and not only a, a text theoretical uh, perspective. Um, Ben, if I can go to uh, to the east, to Malaysia, um, what 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 would be the view in, in your country and perhaps more widely in uh, in your region uh, about uh, the question of uh, ethical aspects of, of, of tax planning and perhaps some of the stuff uh, Scott has been talking about? Malaysia. Benjamin, if you could just perhaps click on yourself, uh, then the sound will be better. Yeah, I've lost video and, and sound. Yeah, Benjamin. So, so I think your connection is not not really uh, what, it, what it could be, <laughs> what it has been. Uh, so, so perhaps you could um, uh, try to uh, have a look at your own connection. And in the meantime, let's move on to uh, to South America, to uh, to Lucas, to Brazil. And well, Lucas, perhaps I could ask you the same question. What what is your your personal view, and perhaps your country's or regional view? about uh, ethical aspects of tax planning, the role of companies, countries, etc. Okay, um, let's sort of go from bigger to smaller. So first the region. In Latin America, and you, you might know this, Latin America is largely a civil law part of the world. So in civil law countries what you usually found find is that um, general anti-avoidance rules or uh, concepts of economic substance and even beneficial ownership, these concepts which are very common to countries of common law uh, background are a bit um, foreign, um, no pun intended, but foreign in terms of um, civil law countries. So, for example, in Brazil we don't have a general anti-avoidance rule. We have one that works as a general anti-avoidance rule, but it's really not one and it's used by tax authorities as that because they just love the idea of having more power in their hands. That's basically how it works. And that's just the general regional concept. Also, um, in terms of the perspective of um, civil law countries of tax planning or international tax planning, you have to also remind yourself that the vast majority of countries in Latin America are still countries that are going through some rough patches in economic um, progress. So you don't have many economic um, uh, powers or um, big countries in Latin America. You have Brazil and you have Chile going through um, a pretty rocky road at the moment 
and and that's basically you have opportunities in other countries, but you know the, we we don't have in Latin America many representatives of the G8, the G20. It's not um, it's not well known for its economic prowess. So because of that, international taxation is still a constant. It's being slowly digested by tax authorities, mostly because they haven't seen that many transactions that have taken place, you know, with uh, international cross-border mergers and acquisitions. As I was saying to Benjamin before the, the hangout started, I just um, would like to repeat to everyone that um, if your country hasn't faced these issues in the past, um, be aware that with the BEPS project and the growing concern for international tax planning, these issues will reach the shores of your country sooner or later. So it's going to happen, and it's interesting that everyone uh, starts discussing these issues in, in a group so wide, so, so big as this one, um, because it's going to help us all. Now, my own perspective, um, in, in just talking a little bit about Brazil, but in my own perspective, uh, tax authorities love the idea of ethical tax planning, because they can shame corporate taxpayers into paying more taxes. So that's a wonderful way and a sort of response in a response to Scott's concerns that you know ethics is, is very interesting when it's the neighbor's ethics but not my own. Um, it's the thing that the Brazilian corporations have to deal with all the time is tax authorities saying, and that's the truth in any country that you research that is going through international tax issues. Uh, they're going to say, well, the law says that this is how I should proceed, and that's exactly what I'm doing. And then you're going to say, well, but, you know, you're not respecting the spirit of the law, or you're abusing the law, or you're abusing the treaty, and because you're doing that, I'm going to create this scenario, this different um, form of calculation of taxes, which coincidentally results in more taxes for me. So it's 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 usually that's the way that happens and Brazil loves it. Actually, that's the sub of another of my papers, which is a lot of countries, a lot of emerging countries, emerging economies are just loving the BEPS project because they have international support to change their tax system and collect more taxes. They love that. The only question is, will there be any corporations to tax at the end of the day after the BEPS project is over and then you have to assign value to countries that have better tax systems than your own. Brazilian tax cor corporate tax system today, the corporate tax rate is 34 percent and that's only the corporate income tax. If you factor in all the taxes on revenue, you get to around 45%. So it's a huge tax burden compared to many countries. And if you move to countries that don't have that, you know, um, that, that, he, that high of a tax rate, then that's a problem. My own perspective is I think that um, factoring ethics into tax planning can be useful at times if you are facing some transactions that have absolutely no economic substance at all. If you're facing extremes, then ethics can come into play. So sometimes that's a problem that is also faced, and I think that um, you and your countries may have seen that, which is many cases that get decided by courts on international tax planning deal with the most extreme cases known to men. So what happens is you have a transaction that um, it's a merger acquisition that takes place in the course of a day. Companies liquidating and then becoming different companies in, a, in the course of one day. Then obviously in a situation like that, Courts and tax authorities are going to say, well, this is, has no economic substance at all. This company existed for, what, six hours, three hours? So there's no economic substance in that. And then other taxpayers that do things by the book and that would never do this transaction because they are concerned with economic substance pay the price because you have the precedent and then it applies to them. So it's, it's, it's a concern, you know. And, then, and for me, I am more much more of a... Uh, I don't like to say the word positivist, I'm much more of a legalist in terms of this is what you should do because it provides certainty and security for companies and that is so important. They have to measure the costs they're going to incur for each transaction because otherwise we're not going to have goods and services in our economy which is the most, you know, forget about taxation, that's the concern of economies in general, you know, and, you, and, and you're sacrificing that because of tax, so that's a problem.
Yeah, so you're saying in, in, in extreme cases, yes, ethical aspects uh, should indeed play a role. Uh, perhaps a little bit of a different topic. You, you mentioned also tax competition in the international arena. I was wondering, does tax competition also play a role within Brazil, perhaps in different provinces or regions of Brazil? Is, is that yes. issue being discussed? Oh, yes. I mean, we have a state value-added taxation, which is just the most ridiculous constitutional creation in history. It's just re it's amazing how states compete for different value-added tax rates and how they compete giving grants and benefits. And because the value-added tax is a non-cumulative tax, so I get a credit for all transactions that sometimes states are going to say, well, the nominal rate is... 15%, but I'm going to give you a credit and your effective rate is going to be 2%. So the taxpayer goes from one state to the other with a credit of 15%. When he gets to the other state, the state says, well, how much is your credit? And he says, 15%. And the state will say, no, it's not. It's 2 because that's what you paid. So that's the credit I'm going to give you and I'm going to impose the tax and everything else. So that's a problem. It, within Brazil, we have tax competition, and it doesn't seem to be going away. Um, and mostly, I mean, we don't have many situations in which we do have situations in, within Brazil in which economic substance plays a role, business purpose plays a role. But um, as I as I say, um, mostly the involvement. I think you you said this brilliantly in one of your videos, which is how the media gets involved in, the, in these debates and sort of reduces these debates to something that it's completely outside of international tax policy. So it's basically is big bad corporations not collecting enough tax and small individuals saying, well, I pay a lot of tax. Why can't the corporation pay more tax? Because they don't pay a fair amount of tax. And what is a fair amount of tax? My perspective is different from yours. And then legal certainty goes out the window. So it's a big problem. Big, big problem. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I think these are some, some great comments about ethical aspects and, and, uh, and competition, tech competition uh, internationally, but even within one country. Um, perhaps uh, I could try to go back to, uh, to Malaysia. I could try perhaps to go back to, uh, to Ben, to Benjamin. Uh, Benjamin, how, how is your connection going at the moment? Uh, Benjamin, can I can I interrupt you? I, it's not it's not. Perhaps you could try to um, to to log out and to log in again. Perhaps that is an idea to to go forward because your connection is is not. Perhaps you you just have to 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 renew it or what or shut down your program and restart it. Um, Perhaps um, if you can try it, then then we can can go to uh, well to Europe actually to the Netherlands to uh, to Lisanne. Lisanne, uh, I'm afraid that our country is known internationally, uh, yeah, for 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 tax for tax competition yeah. and for well, an opportunity for tax planning. Is there mm -hmm. any debate in, in 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 Europe and specifically in the Netherlands on this issue? Um, yeah, there is. Uh, the, um, the Dutch think that, uh, well, they are of the opinion that tax evasion and avoidance is a, is a, is a big problem and needs a worldwide approach. Uh, the Netherlands is one of the countries who has worked hard with all the other countries on the Dutch project. And in certain areas, the Dutch are taking the lead. Uh, the Dutch have worked on their substance requirements and exchange of information. And they are renegotiating with, uh, with, with a lot of developing countries in order to, to avoid treaty shopping. They are re renegotiating their tax treaties. And besides, the Dutch are actively involved with the common reporting standard. Uh, the, um, the early adapters group is going to implement this standard first. And the Netherlands are part of this group. And uh, as you said, the Dutch economy has always focused on international trade. And they want to have a competing tax system. Uh, but they support all the... All the, all the, all the initiatives of the OECD and the European Union, but they are a bit critical sometimes. For instance, it took a while to reach consensus with the European Union on the amendment on the parent subsidiary directive, and the main reason was that they thought that the proposed car could conflict with European case law, especially with Cadbury's swaps. 
And uh, yeah, my personal opinion is that I agree with the Netherlands that tax evasion and avoidance is a worldwide problem and that it should be tackled. Um, I think that companies should con contribute to the economy by paying taxes and that they must pay their so-called fair share. But it's very hard to define what a fair share is or should be. Uh, it depends very much from how you look at it and um, the BEPS action plan and, and European case law are providing us with some guidance on what is allowed and what should be and what should be defined as wholly artificial. But the definition of wholly artificial, which is given in Cadbury's webs, um, yeah, they can give some guidance on the question whether there are enough economic reasons, uh, but it can be argued that those economic reasons are not enough uh, to contribute with a fair share. Um, I think there should be a bit more guidance on this topic. Um, maybe it's a good idea to introduce a code of conduct or something, um, so there, so uh, there is a bit of legal certainty, and that's very important in this discussion. And uh, if you're speaking about a code of conduct, would it be a code of conduct for for states or for companies? Um, maybe both. Maybe they can work together on it, and um, just give some guidelines on. What a fair sh on what a fair share uh, should be. Um, maybe um, it's possible to um, to uh, yeah to look at the overall effective tax rate. What what is reasonable, and if they could determine it per country or, or worldwide. And um, and a company with a very low effective tax rate has something to explain. I think um, so. Maybe they can give some guidance on it. I think that, uh, that a country like the Netherlands is always worried that uh, if you speak about soft law and code of conduct, that um, yeah. the Netherlands will be the only one applying the code of conduct in the end, and that all the others will continue to engage in tax competition, and the Netherlands is the losing state. What, what do you think of that argument? Uh, yeah, I think they have an argument, but maybe we, but maybe the European Union Union can work on this uh, uh, by proposing some hard law on it. Uh, so the other European countries at least have to work with it as well, and they do not have a choice. Yeah, perhaps I think next week uh, the uh, European Commission will uh, publish a new action plan. They will probably relaunch the, 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 their initiative on the harmonization of corporate income tax in Europe. So let's see, let's see what comes of that. Um, thank you very much, uh, Bizana, for your contribution. Uh, in the meantime, in the meantime, I see that uh, that Ben from Malaysia is uh, is back. So uh, let's indeed, Lucas, keep our fingers crossed and uh, see what uh, what your connection is, Ben, at the moment. Should be okay. Eh? So there's uh, a little bit background about Malaysia. Malaysia uh, actually is following a common law country. And uh, it's influenced by uh, UK, Australia, and New Zealand. And what happened is we have all the so-called uh, anti-tax avoidance, OECD. We are following the uh, guidance. And we are all the necessary infra, so-called the uh, law. But what happened is uh, Malaysia is a developing country. We have the problems of uh, in terms of educating the general public about paying tax. And recently, the government, uh, our Malaysian government, has introduced a economic transformation plan, and have spent a uh, quite a bit of money in public uh, so-called expenditure. So they are quite aggressive now to actually uh, to to actually look for money. <laughs> so so they they are actually uh, co tax competition in Malaysia and also Southeast Asia because we are actually attracting try to attract a lot of investment foreign direct investment which is insufficient uh, in terms of GDP. So uh, there's a reason uh, uh, it's very difficult to coordinate 
in Southeast Asia, even worldwide, in terms of uh, this uh, batch project. And in terms of ethical aspects of the uh, tax planning, uh, because Malaysia is following common law, and we actually have a very uh, strict interpretation of tax law. What we look at, what the court is look at is, is if there is a tax stated clearly in the law, tax law, then it should be taxed. Otherwise, uh, it should, should, should not be implied or uh, anyway intend. Uh, that, 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 that is the court look at it, the, 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 the tax law, how they interpret the tax law. Uh, but in terms of it, GAR, so-called general anti-tax avoidance, uh, they will look at it differently. Of course, uh, they will look at the intention, subjective intention, business purpose, just like Lucas said, uh, it's a quite similar situation there. Okay, So, if you are asking the MME to pay more tax or people to pay more tax just because uh, you, you have a loophole, in the tax law, that, that is not a, a right way, I would say, uh, for people to contribute more. It, you should close the loophole. I mean, government play a very important role. I, what I look at is very important role to actually uh, look at the tax law and reform the tax law if there is a loophole. In, rather than you talking about moral, looking at ethical, uh, it's very philosophical arguments, which is uh, different, I, I believe different uh, philosophers have different uh, ideas about moral, ethical principles. Okay, I believe that is also happened in other countries. And what happened is, Different culture, even Western, Eastern culture also contribute to a different interpretation of what moral principle is. That it causes a lot of problem. I would say it causes a lot of problem. And recently, our government introduced uh, yeah. just into the goods and service tax. So they're trying to uh, uh, create more revenues and. Uh, that is also indirectly uh, actually get more revenue for those underground economic activities, okay? which is uh, those people are trying to avoid or uh, evade paying tax by uh, using underground activities. This is uh, what happened in Malaysia. Yeah, and then you spoke about uh, Malaysia being a common law country. Do, do you think it is more difficult in, in a common law country to uh, tax on the basis of principles underlying the law? So it, it, does it make it more difficult to, to counter effectively tax avoidance? Uh, I can't hear very clear. C can so you repeat you your question? Yeah, so if you are a common law country, um, yes. uh, you, you, you follow the rules in the statute quite literally and you say, I think you've said that Either something is in the tax statute and you tax it, or it is not and you don't tax it. So it is not really a principle-based jurisdiction, how it sounds like, but but more a rule-based jurisdiction. Does that make it more difficult to find tax avoidance? Yeah, uh, if if the law, if the tax law doesn't state uh, there is a tax or a right to tax, of course uh, there is more opportunities to do tax avoidance, tax planning. But our Malaysian law, tax law also have a uh, anti-tax avoidance provision, which is similar like the common law country. And this is just like, uh, they can use this general tax avoidance provision to strike, strike down whatever uh, so-called the scheme or invention which is not uh, in, in which economic substance or so-called the uh, uh, they look at the substance 
rather than the form. This is the final uh, resolution they can go to if they really can uh, uh, look at if they really look at the scheme. The scheme fulfill all the so called the wording of the law, but like you say, the spirit it will be light light on this uh, general anti tax widen. And perhaps a final question to you. Um, uh, you also have a country like Singapore in your uh, region. Singapore is known for having a very attractive uh, tax climate. How does the government of Malaysia look at Singapore in this context? Yeah, the, uh, actually what happened uh, in Malaysia, there are a lot of funds flowing into Singapore because uh, they have a very uh, attractive tax rate, low tax rate. Compared to Malaysia, we have uh, about 25% currently corporate tax rate. They have about effective tax rate is about 17%. I think if you're a startup, it's about 9%. I think 9 to 10%. They have a lot of incentive. And there are a lot of, uh, even I have clients actually move their operation to Singapore. Uh, and also a lot of uh, fun actually trying to uh, move out from Malaysia because Malaysia, uh, they are actually locked hole in uh, international tax uh, uh, law uh, because uh, they don't actually tax foreign income which is remitted back to Malaysia. So of course if uh, foreign uh, uh, Singapore it offer a better uh, so-called return and now already, nowadays, uh, Malaysia currency is keep on dropping compared to other Asian currency. That's why uh, a lot of them try to diversify their investment. And Singapore is the best place because it's politically uh, they are quite stable as compared to Malaysia. Thank you very much, uh, Ben, for your uh, comments and insights. Um, well, we've almost reached the end of this Google Hangout session. Perhaps a last question uh, to be answered in, let's say, one minute or so uh, for all of you. And uh, that question uh, would be, how do you think that the uh, BEPS landscape will look like in, let's say, one year from now? If you look at your own country or your own region, what would be likely uh, changes perhaps in the, in the near future, the coming year? Uh, have you got any idea about it? What, for example, in, in, in Canada, Scott, any predictions of what might happen in the next year? Um, I would say status quo. Um, I don't see much possibility, and I don't see much potential for this project, for BEPS. Um, there's just too much power involved. Uh, to really get behind it, um, and uh, and there needs to be, as I said at the beginning, much more data. There needs to be much more data-driven analysis, um, and not just at the. I know there in, in politics, there's the there's the difference between the policy level and the academic, and the theory, and in the pragmatic, so-called. Um, but I think the pragmatic needs to be driven much more by by much stronger theory and theoretical understanding of the topics. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot. And um, if I can go back to to Lucas from uh, from Brazil. It's okay. Um, how I think Brazil is going to um, react and position itself in regard to, with regard to the BEPS project in next year. I think that what Brazil is going to do and I think that what Brazil is doing with the new CFC rules and many countries are going to follow suit, the United States are doing it, Brazil is going to find a way to circle around the multilateral instrument. In what way? It's going to try and create provisions of domestic legislation and interpretations of its own tax treaties which in some way, in some form um, help drive more tax revenues to Brazil using 
the general principles of the BEPS project. So I think that what is happening now in many countries, which, which even before Action 15 are already making moves and taking measures to try and do it domestically, create domestic uh, rules that mimic the BEPS project, um, that's what's going to happen in Brazil in the next year. Thanks very much for, for your comments, Lucas. Um, if I can go to Europe, to, to Lisanne Hall, I don't see her anymore for the moment, perhaps she will come back. Perhaps I can go then to, uh, to Malaysia, to, to Ben. What are your expectations for the near future? Uh, what am I, I look at PETS projects, uh, they, they, they will need a lot of coordination between uh, countries uh, who face uh, so-called uh, base erosion uh, profit sh shifting. But uh, there are a lot of competitions at this moment, especially, you know, Europe is uh, facing a uh, uh, crisis and uh, U.S. have uh, a lot of uncertainty. Even we, show, we, we look at it, show data, show much improvement. They are going to raise the interest rate. So everybody is afraid of economic uncertainty at this moment. And uh, you come up with this bad project. Uh, at the moment, at the critical moment, uh, people are, uh, countries are trying to compete uh, foreign direct investment from each other. And it's very difficult to uh, persuade the other side uh, the other side of the government, uh, you to actually uh, go along with the, the project if they have different policy decision or policy direction. So I would say this is a big uh, effort. This is not easy. Uh, within one year, uh, we don't think there is any uh, much changes uh, except there is some uh, understanding or general principle which uh, the government may actually use it uh, to actually develop their own uh, local international tax law. And the, the, developer, the developing countries have different uh, uh, incentives because they are looking at it, uh, base erosion profit system to them may not be a very major issue because they are trying to attract investment, which is they're trying to create more opportunities such as technology transfer, such as uh, employment. This is, to them, is more important, is it priority, rather than uh, 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 so-called collect more revenue. So indirectly, I would say, uh, in the future, if they collect more, if, if they can create more uh, employment opportunities, or attract more investment, foreign direct investment, of course uh, they will be able to collect more revenue in the, in the long term, not in the short term. So at this moment, I would say this best project is because of the problems of the Western government. Uh, what I look at it uh, is a problem Western government. They have uh, financial difficulties, so they are trying to, of course, uh, trying to raise more revenue for MME, but uh, whether that will be successful is all depend on coordination between the developing and the developer, developed countries. Thank you, Ben. I think that's indeed a very valuable comment that there is, of course, a difference of interest between developed and developing countries. Well, I think this concludes uh, this uh, Google Hangout session. Uh, may I ask um, all of you enormously for your participation. I think we heard some great things, a need uh, for reliable data uh, we heard some great comments on tax competition internationally, but also within one country. And well, perhaps tax competition uh, will not go away completely, especially when in one country it still exists. Uh, ethical aspects, in any case, in extreme situations, should play a role. That's what we've heard. We've heard a, a different difference in opinion in developing countries and uh, and developed countries, common law systems. Uh, uh, more uh, continental uh, system, civil law uh, countries. Um, I think there's some great stuff to, to think about for the rest of this Saturday. And especially because it's Saturday, it's the weekend, 
uh, you deserve all the more kudos and credits for your participation in, um, in this Google Hangout. I would also like to thank our viewers today. Um, I think this Google Hangout session will be on, uh, on, on YouTube for you to, uh, to, to watch again. If you want to um, remember to, uh, to complete your weekly quizzes and also the final exam before the 5th of June 2015, and uh, 2015, and that really completes our course for, uh, for this Google Health session for today. So thanks a lot, and uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend. And bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.